This program is intended for informational and educational purposes only. All views and opinions expressed are the views and opinions of the individuals and sponsors presenting them, and not the LTB network. Enjoy the show. This is Sex and Science Hour with Brian Sovereign and Dr. Stephanie Murphy. Get your freak on. This is Sex and Science Hour. Oh, Welcome to the show. It's about time it was this hour. I know. We've been henting off all our <laughs> stuff all week to let it loose this yeah. one hour, Thursday night. And if you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we try not to pent up anything. But, no, uh, nothing. Hey, Brian, somehow we made it to show 12. I Like every show that goes by, I'm like, how did we actually make it this far? But I think, you know, there might be some changes coming for Sex and Science Hour. There might be. Yeah. Um, we've been on the radio on KCAA. I'm not sure if this show is going to air on KCAA or not. Maybe it'll make the cutoff. But that uh, contract apparently is ending and we were just going to be a podcast only show. So I'm not sure what that means for the content of our show, but we did get a listener email that kind of relates. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, please. Yeah, we got somebody wrote in and said, um, basically, he loves our show, but why do we bleep out our words, like our wordy dirds, you know, like the <laughs> words that you can't say on the radio. And that's actually the only reason we do bleep them out. He's He made some good arguments. He said, you know, like everybody knows what you're saying you really don't have to pretend like right. this is really stupid. Like right. it, what's so offensive about these words? He he actually says he's Dutch and that if they really want to offend someone or curse someone, then they like say that they wish they would get like um, tuberculosis or cancer. <laughs> Which is, that's interesting. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I mean, the Dutch have, uh, they've been ahead of the game as, uh, as far as socially, I think, for, for quite a few hundred years. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was, the, you know, the Dutch Republic was too hot for the pilgrims. That's why they came to America. <laughs> Originally, they didn't plan on it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. Like, there's no way that it could be fun to get tuberculosis. But if somebody says F you, that could potentially be fun if it's done in the right way, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as long as it's wanted, consensual. <laughs> so the only reason that we have been bleeping out words on our show is because we are in the U.S. and we were we were up to this point on a um, terrestrial radio station, and they have uh, silly little rules that they have to follow because the government says that there are seven dirty words you can't say on the radio. Yeah, and uh, they came from George Carlin, funny enough. Yeah, yeah I mean the U.S. is so crazy with this stuff, uh, especially like even. Even, even anime that comes over from Japan, there's points in anime where they literally have to redraw the character to hide like a part of them just just because. Oh, is that? OK, so I, I don't know if this is true. Maybe you can help me separate the fact from fiction here, Brian. But I have heard that in Japan, there's some censorship rule where you can't show a penis on TV. You can show other part, other body parts, sexual acts, no problem, but you just can't yeah. show a penis. And so that's where tentacle porn came from, apparently? No, that's not where... That, this is partly I true. Just, this, this is I must not, have okay. messed that story up around okay. in my head. <laughs> uh, the tentacle porn in Japan has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, this is not... There's paintings where a woman's getting it on with an octopus oh my okay i mean you know so so that's not necessarily new uh there is a cultural even though this is fading away and it's not just in anime it's in regular porn too if you watch the works of like Hitomi tanaka or someone you know you'll see that that she's essentially stroking pixelations uh it's, it's a very strange thing but it, and also in in the drawn and anime and manga you know they have to show like a, a bright light or they have to fuzz it out but that's actually going away they're they're stopping that wow uh, that's so funny yeah it, it's the reasons behind it are rather strange but anyway but it's just ironic because it, it's all culture because in america you can't like show cleavage okay in, well, in anime and then you go to japan and you can't show a vagina but you can show cleavage and it's like wait a minute what yeah, you know what they say about culture, right? It, culture it's, has cult in it. Has it has cult in it, that's Yeah, right. and uh, most of the uh, cultural traditions are not really much better than yeah. cult-like practices, so there you go. But, you know, I understand the point about the bleep, because like, there's, there's actually a, a, an infamous pseudo-documentary, and I say pseudo because I think a lot of the what's said in it is nonsense, uh, called What the Bleep Do We Know? 
Oh, and it's yeah. Like, come on, just <laughs> just call it what it is. You know, I mean, it, how can it be any worse than the fact that the that the movies, the documentary, quote unquote, is made by someone who thinks that she's channeling a 35,000 year old Lemurian general that fought the Atlanteans? <laughs> you might as well just say. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, maybe next episode we will be able to say that. We'll have to see if Adam B. Levine like turns into the censor FCC or whatever. Yeah, this will be interesting. Organization. Because <laughs> if we're not on the radio anymore, but like he still doesn't want us to have bad, dirty words on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network, we yeah. may still be bleeping. I'm not really sure. Or, <laughs> you know, who knows? So I love how our emailer just totally called us out on that. He was like, Absolutely. come on, everybody knows exactly what yeah. you're saying. Kudos. <laughs> And if they don't, maybe they shouldn't be listening to your show. And uh, I agree. (laughs) So we do have something um, a little more serious to talk about. This is actually um, pretty outrageous. I came across this story a couple of days ago, but it's been going on for quite a while. There's a large bank, one of the largest banks in the U.S. And it's not just this one bank. It's lots of different banks. Um, And apparently there's some policy that's coming down from the U.S. government, but is being totally obediently enforced by by the banks because they don't want to get in trouble themselves or they don't want to lose their banking license where they are um, basically closing the accounts of porn stars, of businesses that sell firearms and ammunition, um, of other types of businesses, even businesses that offer items with a lifetime guarantee, businesses that have any that sell any item at all that has, quote, too many chargebacks. Um, they are cutting those um, businesses off. And it's a very deliberate type of cutting off. There's a government program called Operation Choke Point. Can you believe that? that that's so... <laughs> and what they're trying to do is they've identified, you know, all these different industries where they're legal industries, but the government just doesn't like them. So what they want the banks to do, and they're kind of strong arming the banks into doing this, is to cut off access to financial services for those types of business. So even if you have a completely legal gun shop or you're an adult actor or whatever, um, there it happened to a porn producer, too, who tried to like refinance yeah. his mortgage. He was told he was being declined for moral reasons. Right, which California porn is totally legal there. Yeah. I mean, it's... Yeah. Yeah, actually, I mean, all, all of these legal. businesses uh, or most of these businesses are legal businesses right. and you could have a completely legal business, but you could lose your access to your bank account just simply based on the whims of some politicians. And I think that stinks. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I think that's totally not fair. <laughs> no, right. I mean, this is, you know, this is the problem with, you know, I talk about this a lot where government's one thing. OK, but the fact that. That people seem to be generally okay with this because what what are they telling the banks that these businesses are morally objectionable, okay? Or they they might be used for money laundering. Yeah, or or something. And this is the problem: is that society is actually is really still where all the power lies. It's not in the government because if society didn't think that porn was morally objectionable, this wouldn't hold any water, mm. you know. And 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 in in California, it's very very easy for the people to, you know, make propositions against the government and overturn stuff. And, you know, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's a rare state as far as that goes. Uh, and, you know, with that in mind, I mean, again, it's just for me, it highlights how crazy society is uh, yeah. in, in that it's it's I'm far more terrified of like conservatism than I am of government. Yeah, the moral majority, yeah. the people who want to legislate their their version of morality or what yeah. they think, how they think people should live. I, I agree with you. I mean, these banks are saying saying, well, we're declining your mortgage refinance for moral reasons, or we're closing your bank account because your business is immoral. But it's not a moral choice for these banks at all. They're having a gun pointed at them by the government. And isn't that what Christians always say? Like, if you're like, it's only a moral choice. If you make a quote, a good moral choice, it's only moral if you actually decided it. It, It's not moral if somebody's like forcing you to choose that way. Right. And and, I mean, I, the same concept of, you know, welfare versus charity, right? Like if the government steals money from everybody and then gives it to a charitable cause or gives it to somebody who needs it, well, you know, maybe that's great for that person who's receiving the money and they needed it and they, they need some help. But it's not a moral thing. It's not charity. That's not a charitable act because the people who uh, the money was taken from in the first right. place didn't choose to give it. Right. It would yeah, only be charitable if they chose it. <laughs> yeah. You're not doing good by paying your taxes because no. it's not a choice. You no, have and, to pay them. And actually, like yeah. a lot of people... <laughs> 
a lot of people who support social welfare programs, you know, object to paying for wars. You know, the U.S. just had this big bombing campaign in Yemen, right? There's all these kids oh, that got killed and yeah, nobody talks about it. Yeah. I'm I, so sick of it. I, I don't want to pay for this anymore. But you got you to gotta understand, that, that, you know, the people that are just as dangerous as Al Qaeda are the ones that we got to take their bank accounts away, you know? Oh, the yeah, give me a break. <laughs> and the people that are, that are you know, schlepping the guns, we got to put a stop to this. You know, porn is just one step away from terrorism, really. That's right. It's moral terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this is like just taking it to an absurd extreme. And, you know, no doubt this is happening to a lot more people. There, was a, a, a cup, there were a couple of porn stars who kind of spoke out about it recently. There's an article here in Vice where um, Tegan Presley, who is a... I guess she's a porn actress. I don't know. She who, used to be. She, she doesn't. Yeah. Right. She used to be. So she she actually had a bank account closed at Chase Bank and they they closed her husband's account, too. He's not even a porn star. Yeah. It just, was only because they were married. Yeah. Their social security <laughs> numbers are linked. I mean, that's crazy. insane. Like you could. So you that means you could you could be just living your life and your spouse engages in a totally legal business activity. Right. And your bank accounts both get shut down. For no apparent reason. I mean, yeah. that's just like if that doesn't make you want to run away from the banks, I don't know what does. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is that, I mean, this makes a perfect case for cryptocurrencies. Uh, you know, to, yeah. to get on that. <laughs> well, that's where we're going with this. I mean, because really, I I hope these people who are getting cut off, and it's happening to Bitcoin businesses too. I mean, I know for you know, I I I have it. I have heard a lot of rumors in the Bitcoin community that you know the major. Bitcoin payment processors will actually drop um, people like gun dealers and people who are involved in yeah. pornography or any kind of adult services because they're afraid that their bank is going to drop them. Their bank is looking for any reason to drop the Bitcoin payment processor as a customer. And so they're they're scared and they end up being the enforcer, even though they don't want to be. And uh, it's just it, it's really nasty, the kind of. Um, <laughs> paranoid environment this yeah, creates. I, I just who, who do these people think that they are that they can good question it, 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 <laughs> just, it, it, it blows my mind it's like no you can't be in porn we will shut down your bank I mean, it, like, there's yeah. it's this very weird and then even like you said even the Bitcoin companies who this just shows even more because they're they're following suit just like the banks. How you know they're they're following that again? There's no government squeezing them. Not directly. You know, not directly. Maybe indirectly. <laughs> but what's squeezing them is just this moral, you know, idea going yeah. around, or these fears of like, oh, you know, guns. Oh, guns. So oh, terrible. You know. And I don't even like guns. No. I, know, I, I, yeah, I actually not, I hate guns yeah. myself. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I don't want to outlaw them. I don't want to outlaw anything, but I hate guns. But what is this? You know, what I mean, how do people think that that somehow them squeezing you, you know, be it morally lawful or, you know, through the through legal matters or whatever, that somehow you're actually making the person better? Yeah. You're acting like a parent and your child's going to do what children always do. They're, they're going to rebel. <laughs> they're not going to say, oh, well, I learned my lesson. No, they're going to run to altcoins or they're going to run to Bitcoin, hopefully, or something, you know, that's out there. Yeah. I mean, what do you do? Like, there are a lot of more financial services for people who are so-called unbanked in the U.S. now. Sure. I, like, bank accounts are getting to be more of a problem than anything else. You oh, know? Yeah, yeah. Like, they're, they're not especially efficient or like, you know, great customer service for receiving or sending payments anymore. You know, they're no, slow right. and cumbersome. It takes three to five days. You know, they got to settle up uh, through the clearing houses. And, you know, it's it kind of feels like just this old technology. You got to give up all your information. You got to if, if you do anything that's like, the you know, just an unusual type of transaction, even if it's completely legal, even if you didn't do anything wrong, they can report you to yeah. the government and not tell you about it. And I mean, it's just becoming more of a liability all the time. And oh, so, yeah. but what do you do? Cause like not everybody lives in a place where they want to keep a bunch of cash under their mattress no, or, yeah. or whatever, you know, I mean, I think Bitcoin is a solution, but you can't, it might be, depending on where you are, again, it might be difficult to just do everything um, in Bitcoin. It's going to be getting easier all the time. But for sure. someone who has no experience with Bitcoin and they have to close their bank account within three days and they're panicking because they can't get another account and they don't know where to transfer their money, that's a big problem. Yeah, I agree. I mean, things are being developed to make cryptocurrencies easier uh, to use 
and to get access to and whichever. Uh, you know, other than that, I yeah, I, I don't know what you do. I mean, you know, you can go down the list of getting prepaid cards and all this stuff, you know. But um, yeah, it, it's it's making it harder and harder all the time. Right. Well, there is kind of a, I guess it's not a silver lining because it doesn't really relate to this story, but there is um, something that's been talked about quite a bit over the last six months or so since I think they, I think they announced it. Um, we've got Dark Wallet, which has just come out in, in alpha. Um, it, it's a Chrome extension. You can download it. Um, I think there's, they're just, you know, darkwallet.org or something. Yeah, you have to go through the GitHub to get it. Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, you can play with it. And what this is, is um, a Bitcoin wallet, basically, that can allow you to automatically do mixing with your coins. So it, um, I think it uses CoinJoin. And uh, in that case, if you use that wallet, mixing of the Bitcoins is automatic. So it gives you ex- extra financial privacy that you don't have to specifically opt into and do an extra right. step. Yeah, I mean, this allows for what they call stealth addresses. Where, yeah, what is a stealth address exactly? I mean, okay. yeah. well, well, a stealth address is a Bitcoin address. You'll, you'll, You'll know it instantly because it has an S, I think, in front of it. Yeah. Um, and we, we, you and I have played with Dark Wallet a little bit. And yeah. It, it's pretty slick. And yeah. Talk about ease of use. It's It's got that. Um, and with this, essentially with a stealth wallet, is that it generates, you know, its own, like, it, it generates multiple uh, other addresses. addresses. So you can give someone a stealth address and they'll send Bitcoins to it, but then it goes to some other address that they don't know and it, they can't really track. And Yeah, it won't show as the stealth address. It'll yeah. show as something else and then that address pretty much disappears And but everything still goes to the to the one wallet, to mm. the one self, uh, stealth address. And is that, is, the, is that the P2SH thing that everybody talks about? The pay, pay to script hash or whatever? Like there's something built into the Bitcoin proto- protocol that allows yeah, this you This isn't exactly, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is kind of a more of an offshoot of that idea. Yeah. Okay. We're getting too so, nerdy here. Yeah, <laughs> but that's. But I mean, but this is interesting because Dark Wallet is trying not just to. They're not just a wallet, uh, and I'm excited about this because I've had I've had some you know not totally flattering words in the past for Dark Wallet, but now I have a much better understanding of what they're doing. Um, yeah. And Dark Wallet is. I mean, they're literally trying to make the entire economy and identity service mm-hmm. that the internet can provide. Um, and making it all go dark. And by dark means it's totally anonymous. Yep. Or it's as anonymous as you want it to be, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's that's impressive, and that will... that's something that's badly needed because right yeah. now you don't have any of those technologies that you have to opt out of. They're all opt in, yeah, right. Like you have to choose to use mixing services or whatever. Or and I don't even know that you could use stealth addresses before this. I had no idea. No, I don't how think do there that. was an implementation for it. So this yeah. is this is pretty pretty unique stuff. Um, and and it's it's really it's exciting uh, because this is something I've talked about on my own show, Sovereign Tech. Where where I've said that, look, after the Snowden revelations occurred, I said there's going to be a crypto economy that's going to come out and it's going to it's going to crash, you know, essentially the world as we know it. And this is Dark Wall is one of the few things out there that's really pushing towards that. That's that's getting rid of the status quo. Well, don't they already say there was this really famous article that went around like a year ago about the uh, System D which is basically sure. people who do business without licenses and right. without paying taxes and stuff. And it's like two thirds of the world's economy yeah, and it's uh, growing. Right. Or they call it a shadow economy. Yeah. That's but it's, not, word for it. it's ironic that two thirds yeah. of the world's economy would be a so-called shadow economy. Oh, yeah. That's like well, that's, eclipses the, uh, that's an eclipse of, yeah. <laughs> of the real so-called white market or whatever. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's really, it's amazing. And, and dark wallet is just, you know, this whole going dark thing. The government's, the U.S. government, anyway, is afraid of this. The FBI has papers and dark wallet links to them, saying it's like, yeah, what do we do about this going dark thing? Because it's coming. Wow. Yeah, baby, it's coming. Yeah, and there's and nothing you can do, and the porn stars can be set free. <laughs> That's right, free the porn. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the people who made dark wallet have said, yeah, try, try to come get us. Yeah, you know, just bring it. <laughs> yeah, they they really have their principles in the right place. So Absolutely. kudos to them. There's more coming up here on Sex and Science Hour. Stay tuned. Okay, guys and gals, listen up. We're about to talk shit. No, no, don't laugh. This is a very serious fecal matter. Here on Sex and Science Hour, we talk a lot about health in the human body. But did you know that our bodies are designed to squat when we poop? That's right. This whole sitting on the toilet thing, that's a bunch of crap. And it may contribute to all kinds of unpleasant stuff like hemorrhoids, constipation, and diverticulitis. Ew. So... 
we'd like to tell you about a very simple device that will help you solve this problem and get you back to doing your business the way Mother Nature intended it. It's called the Squatty Potty, and it works by gently helping you raise your feet when you use the toilet. This is a product that Brian and I both use, and it's made us into believers. And although the folks at Squatty Potty in no way endorse this show, we do have an affiliate link that you can use to get one, which will also help us out. Just check our show notes for the link and get ready to say goodbye to your bathroom problems for good. Now back to Sex and Science Hour. This is Sex and Science Hour. Welcome back to the show. I'm Stephanie, and you're Brian. Of course. You know, we, I don't know if we ever introduced ourselves in the first segment of the show. Oh, well, yeah, sometimes... The, the robotic these, voice does a good job. That's true, yeah. <laughs> sometimes these things fall through the cracks here on episode 12. Uh, <laughs> Okay, we got some science coming up in this segment. Um, now, this is kind of a stretch to call it science, but it is a supposedly, you know, scientific poll. And I think poll results can sometimes be quite interesting because they reveal a lot of inconsistencies between people's thinking, typically. Okay. Internal, I'm talking internal inconsistencies, like people hold conflicting beliefs. You know? Sure, sure. And of course, you know, when you're looking at a poll, it's a population-based sample of people. But, you know, sometimes from the percentages, there's got to be some overlap between people who simultaneously hold these kind of contradicting views right. <laughs> in the same person. So anyway, this is a, a poll from Gallup, you know, which is kind of this respected polling organization. And they asked a bunch of people who live in the U.S., um, you know, so the U.S. has 50 states, right? And the states all have their own different laws and like culture and things like that, whatever that is. I uh, can't believe I just said that. But, you know, well, they're, they're, they do. There's a differing culture depending on where you go, certainly. Yeah, I guess it's more regional than like based on the state. Like if you don't, if you cross the border from New Hampshire to Vermont, like it's maybe not like a super huge change. I, I don't no. know. Maybe it is. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, like, okay. I, I, it took me, I lived in New York. I drove three hours and I was in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. One complete difference between, even though the lines are so short in between each other. I mean, again, three hours, come mm -hmm. on driving. Um, you know, if you're in New York, it's a pretty good bet. The person you talk to watches wrestling just because they're within those arbitrary lines, you know, but I mean, you go outside <laughs> of them, you have no idea. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, it's... Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, sometimes borders can reflect, like, sort of natural regions, but the point I was trying to make is that borders are just imaginary lines. Oh, they, no, they are, they are. But it's an idea that people believe in, and so, like, when you're born in New York, you're like, yeah, I'm in New York, I like wrestling. Yeah, or sure. I, I like the Mets. I think it does tend to be a little <laughs> self-reinforcing, you yes. know, like... Yeah, it, absolutely. It, a lot of people, if, you know, like, if they're born in... I don't know, Illinois, but they like guns, they might be like, I'm going to move to Texas. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so anyway, um, there was a poll that was done among people who lived in the U.S. in these different states. And it, interestingly, there were a couple of places, like um, just a few states, Illinois, Connecticut, Maryland, where pe like about half of people said that if they could, they would leave the state and move somewhere else. And if then, they could. Yes. The, the question was phrased, and it's always very important how they phrase the question. The question was phrased as, if you could, like, if you could leave, you know, would you? Would you want to leave mm -hmm. if there were no, nothing holding you back? And, like, half of the people who lived in some of these states said, yes, I would leave if I could. Now, <laughs> the thing, <laughs> the reason I brought up the contradictory beliefs thing was that among the people where, you know, like half of the people who lived in these states said that they would leave among these these states, um, they were the people were asked, OK, how likely are you to move out of the state somewhere else within the next year? And like in Illinois, half of the people said they wanted to move, but only like 19 percent said that they were either extremely likely to move, very likely to move or somewhat likely to move. Wow. Even somewhat likely to move. So, so like, the 80% of people are definitely not going to move, <laughs> even though 50% of the people want to move. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> hey, that's crazy. Uh, you know, and, and definitely, I wonder, like, what the reasons were. And I wonder well, how many... Well, they actually asked him about that. Okay. Do you want to know what the reasons were? Sure, but I also wonder if how many of these people, especially within that 80%, were born there. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Because I think once you kind of break the seal, like if you move out of the state that you were born in, Mm -hmm. it's easier to move after that because you kind of realize, or especially if you live outside of the country, you know, like if if you, even if you travel outside the country and you're like, oh yeah, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to just take a back, take a suitcase and make a life here. You know, I don't have to be limited to where I was born or near my parents or whatever, you know, once you realize that, I think that's a real element of mentally breaking some chains and breaking free yeah. right but well, but then again like some people really like the region that they were born in right oh sure i i liked parts of new york i still think some of it is the most beautiful land in the planet but yeah. um, you know that doesn't mean that that's where i'm going to stay the rest of my life uh, <laughs> yeah, why did you move out of new york it's new york <laughs> but the I mean, Empire State. <laughs> <laughs> so paint a picture for people who like maybe live in europe or something what is it like in new york uh, well, okay. I'm not talking about New York City. The reasons for that are pretty obvious. I yeah, think, I people think people wanna... don't know that like New York is actually a huge state. Like there's a huge amount of land that is like incredibly rural. Yeah. I mean, I did grow up in Queens for a while, so I know New York City well, but mm-hmm. um, New York State by and large is farmland. Like, I mean, literally it's farmland. Yeah, there's there's Syracuse, there's Buffalo, there's Albany, you know, there's cities, but uh, but that's it. The rest of it, is, or Rochester, you know, the rest of it is just pure on farmland. Yeah, it's um, literally like this one fingertip of this landmass that is called New York is yeah, like the most populous, <laughs> densely yeah. populated place in the world. And yeah, know, so I mean, it's just maybe you not know, in the world, but <laughs> it's pretty dense. Right. I mean, so you have you know, kind of like like smaller cities, nothing in comparison to even Buffalo or again New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, but by and large, yeah, it's uh, you know. It, I, it's smaller cities, and like I said, there's just cows and horses. But like, what was it? Did you not like the rural places, or well, did no. you? Was it like the, thing the is, nanny is that you, state? Yeah, because you have this massive city, New York City, that controls the other ninety nine percent of the state uh, politically. Yeah. When look, the laws required, and I don't think I'm an anarchist, okay? But the laws required for New York City to function the way it does are meaningless to the other ninety nine percent of the state. Mm. And so you're living, you know, even though you're living out in the country, the laws affect you like you're like you're <laughs> in the city. Even though you're living in the country, you can't buy a soda that's bigger than sixteen yeah, ounces. Something you like can't, that. I mean, there's can't... laws that are New York City specific and don't affect the rest, but yeah. by and large, the budget affects it. And so, you know, it's it's terrible. Yeah, actually, so of the people, so the, this poll did ask people like if they were planning to move, why were they? Why did they want to move? And of the people that said they were going to move out of New York, um, like f- 15% of them said the taxes were like the reason that they wanted to leave. Yeah, well, there's a reason I left New York, too. Uh, yeah, that's that's one. And then 21% said cost of living, which, of course, taxes go into that. Sure, they're one and the same. Yeah. So no one said family? Um, yeah, 13% said, uh, oh, sorry, 16% said, um, family or friends. So that's fewer people than set, cited cost of living. <laughs> so that's, well, that, that's, I guess that's good because I was worried, you know, cause I think this family thing, and I don't want to go too deep into this, mm-hmm. but I think this family thing is just as perhaps made up as the, the, the oh. as the arbitrary lines between states are. Yeah. I think there's so many people who grow up with just this, um, you know, their families kind of beat it into their heads that they have some obligation to like take care of them when they're old and sick or whatever, or spend a certain amount of time with them or have their grandkids, you know, be exposed to the extended family or whatever. When you get this whole shtick of, you know, blood is thicker than water. Well, guess what? There's a lot more water on planet earth than there is blood. So forget the blood. Okay. (laughs) What a weird, uh, statement anyway. It's sick. It's it's sick really. Yeah. But, (laughs) But my point is, is that, you know, come on, you're not, you have, you're beholden to people that you may have nothing, really nothing that matters, Mm -hmm. which is your thoughts, your own ideology in common with. Yeah. You got to sacrifice your own life to, uh, to do what your family wants you to do. I think that's a really damaging thing that a lot of people don't, a lot of people never feel like they're free from. It's mental slavery. Yeah. And I mean, like that's part of becoming a free person, I think is to like, individuate yourself from your family yeah. and you know perhaps you want to spend time with your family and that's fine that's you great know, that's if you totally love your family fine. that's so cool go for it some people do and and yeah like that's that's great if, if you have a beautiful relationship with them you want to spend time with them go for it of course i'm just saying it shouldn't be an unchosen obligation that right. you somehow incurred by being born you know yeah i mean and just yeah don't fall for the you know it's like well i gotta be there for my family no you don't. You don't have to be there for anybody but yourself. And if you're not, in fact, if in you're fact, not, if you're not there for yourself, you y- can't do anything for anyone else. Exactly. If you're not looking out for number one, if you're not your best, 
how can you help anybody else? Yeah. You know, or how, how much more could you help if you really wanted to, if you were looking out for yourself more? Mm. Absolutely. Anyway. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, I just was shocked by the number of people, we can move on from this, but I was just shocked by the number of people who want to leave the state that they're living in, but they have some excuse or something that's yeah. holding them back. They won't put their money where their mouth is. That's Yeah. And I mean, it can be, some people can have challenging situations. I get it. I understand. Especially if you've established a business somewhere, like it's hard to just pick that up and move. Sure. If you're not a college student, it's hard to move, right? You sure. got a lot of loose ends to tie up, but it's not impossible. And if you really want to do it, you can, you're not trapped where you are. Yeah. I, I think mean, it's a very empowering message to say that. Yeah. Just, just think that you're, you are, you're really, you're sacrificing if you're not <laughs> doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so speaking of studies, um, there's there's something going on at MIT. Um, and by the way, I think MIT is going to have some kind of Bitcoin conference uh, this weekend after we're recording this. Um, and apparently there's a donor who was, you know, is part of Wall Street, an early Bitcoin investor, um, who has sponsored a project to give $100 worth of Bitcoin to every undergraduate student at MIT. I'd heard about this, um, and I, I want to make yeah, this... Yeah, we heard about it before it was announced. <laughs> yeah, I, I, want, I want to make this very clear that my We're opinions... so cool. <laughs> yeah, well, my opinions are my own. They're not yours. Y That's you know, right, they, yes. You, Stephanie, have your own opinions. We are not a hive mind. No, we are we not a each hive other, mind. We love each other, but <laughs> right. not and, a hive mind. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so my opinions are my own. And the way that this got reported, and this is not necessarily the fault of MIT... But this was getting reported as, oh, the first real Bitcoin economy. And all, I, and all I could think about that, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it was what? <laughs> no, sorry. This... I've got the numbers. New Hampshire was the first Bitcoin economy. What about the Silk Road? Yeah, the Aren't Silk... there more under people in the Silk Road than yeah. uh, the MIT undergrad? There's this whole oddball. And again, these opinions are my own. There's this whole <laughs> oddball like uh, worship of MIT, that when MIT finally gets on board with something, mm -hmm. oh, suddenly it's serious. Yeah. Well, screw them. Bitcoin's been serious for years, and you're just now getting on, and oh, yeah, the, we're going to really use that Bitcoin. No, let me tell you, I've been, I've been here since 2011. I've been watching people really use Bitcoin to buy dinners, to buy newspapers, to get a haircut, to do everything you could imagine. Oh, yeah. Okay? For years. People were buying stuff with five bitcoin casacious coins when they were worth like a dollar oh, each sure, or sure. two dollars <laughs> or at pork fest okay an annual mm -hmm. event held here in the, new hampshire the porcupine freedom festival yeah yes. exactly uh i saw people buying i mean they were buying food in droves with one bitcoin a pop when they were five dollars when oh, bitcoin yeah. was five dollars look stop this story is it's interesting to hear about but this story's crap this story is <laughs> meaningless to, yeah, well, yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see your point. Nobody acknowledges the early history of Bitcoin no. because they all want to seem like they're they're cool and not acknowledge the yeah, libertarian no, no, hipsters look, who yeah. did it years before yeah. they did. It's not cool until MIT or, or Stanford does it. And that, that that's crap. Oh, it's so last year. It not really is. Yeah, it really is so <laughs> three years ago. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. It can be a bit frustrating. But, I mean, I think, let's be honest, like, the real reason they're doing it, it's not like a philanthropic thing or anything. They no. want to see how people, they want to see what people do with the Bitcoins. Right. They want to see what businesses pop up. And they want to, probably, they might, you know, do some extraction of data from the blockchain, you know. Yeah, most likely. I, I'm sure this is somewhat of a test study, but yeah. that's not the way that, uh, again, I know MIT wasn't necessarily spinning it this way, but the bulk of the media has been spinning it this way, that this is the this is the, sh the future economy. Mm. And it's like, well, you know, the future economy has been around forever. Yep. You it's guys already, are, you people it's are already so here. Behind. Future's already here, baby. That's right. <laughs> You know, are, are there going to be people like pushing Keynesian economics and saying, well, you know, the government should just give everybody $100 worth of Bitcoin and tomorrow? <laughs> Maybe they could, right? They could just take the stolen Bitcoin. So, some so people, have, I mean, this God. is what Aurora Coin did, right? They I, just I really need to every... stop giving them ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Well, I not said, that Aurora Coin is Keynesian, but. No, but it is like it has an element of that. You know, John Maynard Keynes was a so-called economist, which a lot of people don't agree with his so-called economic theories right. but he said that like 
a bad economy is caused by not enough spending. Yeah, so you exactly. got to stimu- stimulate spending and you got to prime the pump by inflating the currency supply, which you can't do with Bitcoin. Right. Uh, you got to inflate the currency supply um, so that people spend more money and encourage people to go shopping. And that's what will kickstart the economy. And, uh, you know, in practice, I'm no I'm no economist, but, you know, I'm pretty sure the government's been Every government has been trying that for yeah. many, many years, and uh, it's not uh, shown empirically to work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I think or the, philosophically. <laughs> no, right. I mean, but I, I think the digital realm, the digital economy, uh, you know, and what I mean by that is like even, you know, books, uh, MP3s, Bitcoin, go down the list, take your pick literally has taken every economic theory in history and i say this all the time and it's tossed it out the window okay but the point being is that it didn't i don't think it just tossed out uh austrian economics it tossed out keynesian economics it tossed them all out i could be wrong so there's no laws of economics i disagree i think bitcoin i think laws of economics are kind of like laws of physics you don't just toss gravity out the window Well, we'll see what happens, but uh, don't be getting any ideas, governments. We'll be back. (laughs) This is Sex and Science Hour. More coming up. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to take a short opportunity to say a huge thanks to those listeners who sent us tips. It is so cool to know that people are listening. And not only that, that they take a minute out of their day to uh, show us that they appreciate us. So yay, thank you so much. Also want to say a huge thank you to those who took the time to shop on Amazon through our Amazon affiliate links. That really helps us out. And it's so cool because we get to spy on you. Oh, not in that way, not in a creepy way. At least we try not to be creepy. But we do see what you buy on Amazon. Amazon. And before you get nervous about that sex toy you purchased, it is not attached to your name. We don't see who bought it. It's just what you bought. So here are some of the things that people bought using the Sex and Science Hour Amazon affiliate links, which you can find in our show notes. We've got some cool Kindle ebooks, the four hour work week, hundred dollar startup, an iPod classic with lots of cables, kids books and lots of baby stuff. And even a microphone mixer, some windscreens and pop filters for some aspiring podcaster out there. So thank you so much for keeping our show going. We really appreciate you. And now back to the show. This is Sex and Science Hour. Welcome back to the show. Yeah. <laughs> you always say yeehaw in the third segment. I think it's becoming kind of a tradition and, you know, you're an anti-traditionalist. What are you That's doing? true. I'll, I'll figure out something. I'll say snarf blap next time yeah that's a great idea never mind Ryan. actually snarf, <laughs> snarf blast probably like copyrighted by disney so i, I shouldn't use that <laughs> well anyway um you know there's a, like this cool story i wanted to talk about i've been saying for years and i hate to i'm not trying to take credit for this because i didn't actually implement the idea and i'm sure a lot of other people thought of it at the same time okay but i've always kind of thought that you know roads okay there's a lot of just unused open, flat, you know, not shaded by trees, black surface area of asphalt. Like, why could you not use that for solar uh, energy harvesting? Roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. Well, (laughs) that would be great if there were flying cars already, so we didn't need the roads. Yeah, I don't know about the flying cars thing, but go ahead. (laughs) Why not? You don't like a, you wouldn't want a flying car? People have a hard time driving on a two-dimensional space and a three-dimensional uh, well, driving that's why you do I'd it be all. Terrified. That's why you do it all with drones, self-driving, Ethereum-controlled, uh, made drones. safe controlled, <laughs> made safe controlled <laughs> drones. I'm just kidding, Brian. But yeah. <laughs> but I've seriously, I've always thought that you know, there's all this like blacktop, and no, nothing is being done with it. I mean, you know, it kind of very inefficiently absorbs sunlight, and you sure. know, maybe in the winter in a place like New Hampshire where it's really cold and icy all the time, in the six months of winter uh it sort of absorbs sunlight and you maybe can melt the ice a little bit but it's really not reliable but you know why couldn't there be some kind of cell underneath or on the side or something and uh that energy could kind of be stored for later when it needs to be heated up and then like wires go through the road and i've always kind of thought that if we actually had roads that were not um done by the government which we do i mean you know a lot of people have private driveways Uh, malls, plazas, everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Businesses create their own parking lots and their own roads inside of um, shopping areas where they want people to go. Everybody made their own roads before 19... 
32, I think. Yes, that's so, true. And I now mean, people don't know how we would have roads without the government. But actually, like the inner, the, not to get conspiratorial here, but the whole interstate highway system, that was all for moving tanks around. Yeah, that was designed. It's a 24 page bill out of the 40s that was essentially, or, you know, by Eisenhower, that was designed for moving military vehicles. It was not for civilian use. Uh, it just ended up you know, kind of ended up that way. Being a boondoggle, yeah. Yeah. They saw an opportunity to make people believe that without government, who would build the roads? They saw a way to make money by doing tolls on them. So, (laughs) you know, it it made sense Uh, on a government standpoint. The amount of tolls where they say, oh, yeah, it'll go after 10 years, never goes away. It never goes away. We said we were going to stop charging it, but we got to maintain this thing. So... (laughs) You know, so it's always funny because, like, without government, who will build the roads? It's like, well, hopefully somebody better than the government because they're doing such a piss poor job. Yeah, of there building really these is so much technology that could be harnessed on roads. That's oh, not, yeah. I mean, the surveillance technology on roads, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> License plate readers and all these easy pass things. I mean, you can be tracked on the roads, but like, as far as technology that actually improves safety, improves people's lives, no, they don't really care about that. No, you know, I mean, in 30,000 people, uh, I think you wanted to talk about something else as far as roads, but uh, while we're right here. <laughs> we'll get to it. This is a good conversation. 30,000 people at least uh, a year. Again, that's 30,000 people. I, I think one person dying is too much, but 30,000 people a year die due to road conditions. Yeah. At least. That number's probably gone up because that statistic's about seven years old. Okay? I thought it was 50,000, but that was like five years ago. Yeah, so I don't know. It's, it it's somewhere in the tens of thousands of people. Sure. In tens the US. of thousands of people die in the U.S. alone from road conditions. Okay. Now, is it the weather? No. Most likely not. Uh, what it's not like because most of these deaths aren't happening in snowy areas. They're happening in the middle of summer. Is because people are traveling more. Maybe well, whatever. Brian, it's it's the drunk drivers. We need to um, police them more strictly, and we need to ban right. alcohol. We need <laughs> I, to have, bring back prohibition. Really, prohibition. that's the only way to solve it. Ironically, drunk driving is a completely different statistic from from the ones that, from the one that we listed. Yeah, these are non alcohol yeah, related. Okay. okay, and and this number. Look, the thing is, is that people want to like blame drivers. Nobody ever thinks, what if it's the road system that sucks? <laughs> yeah. And it's literally the road, the way roads are built and designed is what's killing people. But everybody just wants to blame other human beings. You know what I mean? They never want to blame institutions. Yeah. They never want to blame like this, this, this thing that people just completely take for granted. I mean, consider this. The only thing that keeps you from running into, you know, you're, you're driving down a street. One guy's, you know, coming, you know, heading west. The other guy's going east. Mm-hmm. The only thing that keeps the guy from going west and the guy from going east and hitting each other is a line of paint. <laughs> no one thinks about that. That's terrifying. Yes. And, and, and it's, a, it's amazing that people somehow follow that line of paint. Okay? But Some they do. do. But that's all there is keeping you from doing that. You think that's not dangerous? You want to talk about danger? Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is turning into quite the rant, but it's, yeah. <laughs> it's it's true. Like, how much better could we be doing? Like, there are so many different technologies that could be tried oh, yeah. and could be experimented with. Not only that, but there's so many regulations on cars that just prevent innovation from happening that could right. be, uh, you know, it could bring about better safety, could bring about better comfort or whatever. But, you know, we just don't have the opportunity to play around with that. There's this, there's this Disney film from the 1950s where they're depicting what they thought the roads would look like in the year 2000 or something like that. And it's a really great film. It's incredibly creative. They got all these different, you know, like rails and um, loop-de-loops and like um, self-driving cars and maglevs. I mean, and so they're really like thinking creatively outside of the box and thinking about what transportation would be like in the future. But we don't have that. No, no. It's the year 2014. No, you know, it's a great We're using 1940s technology on our roads. (laughs) Absolutely. It's a great point because like you just walk into Epcot, you know, at Disney World. And you just, I mean, you can't, if you don't walk out of, I understand you're supposed to be smiling when you go to Disney. Mm. If you don't walk out of Epcot in a fit of depression, (laughs) saying, what the hell is wrong with us as a species that we're not already doing all this? Oh man, you're, you're twisted. You're twisted (laughs) if you're not depressed at that because it's so exciting. You know, and, and Brian, you're ruining people's trips to Disney World. Come on, I, hey, uh, that's not very. My nice. trip got ruined because I saw the future, and the future is run down because it was built in the '60s by Walt. You know, by, by the Disney company. And uh, whoa, what happened? What happened? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, the, anyway, this all started because 
there is a guy who's actually working on this very idea that we just started talking about where he wants to build like basically a, um, a parking lot or eventually a road that has that is basically tiled with solar panels and it will that could handle things driving on it. Yeah. Yeah. That could handle the pressure of um, vehicles driving over it. And um Tires, another thing. Why do we have air-filled tires that can pop? Anyway, that's another total now, tangent. Th- th- those things are getting developed, uh, but... Not soon enough. Not you soon enough. I think we'd have solid tires by now. But anyway, um, <laughs> we're self-healing or something like that. But anyway, um, this guy is building like a parking lot that has uh, solar tiles that you can drive over, but will also capture the sun and can be used to melt ice and to power road lights. Like, that's really creative thinking. Like, why not use what's already there, which is the sun... Right. How long until the road mines bitcoins as you're driving over the road? You know, you're using the friction of your car to do some bitcoin mining or something. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of creative thinking that I would really like to see blossom and take take shape. Um. Well, you know, I, I like this idea, but I have a caveat mm-hmm. in that just like with electric vehicles, a lot of these things clearly only work in California mm. or, or like in the south. Um, yeah, that could be. I mean, that could be. But like, maybe there's some other way to make it work in colder climates, or there's a different technology that would make more sense. Maybe. Uh, you know, I mean, like something that, that I like, uh, you know, or maybe a, a modification of this, mm-hmm. uh, is that if you ran like copper wire in the roads, in the asphalt, yeah, and then maybe if you had it, you know, had, had it at certain areas... Um, of the road, you had solar panels, not part of the road, but up from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that energy collected was being used to heat the copper wire so that it automatically melted the ice of the roads. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, this is actually set up I did as a kid on our house, uh, you know, when I was growing up. I mean, I, I helped my dad put it up. But anyway, this is the idea is that if you just had like a copper wire running, it would keep all the icicles from hanging because it would heat up that part of the of the, of the roof. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's a cool idea. Yeah, that the, the, sounds the useful. thing is, is that if you go to touch the roof, you don't touch it because you're going to get a pretty get good burned. shock. So shock or burn? Uh, well, you, you'll get a shock. I mean, okay. you, you know, you've got that that current and oh, all. Oh, because there it's a live wire. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's it. a live wire. So, but I mean, if it was an asphalt and it was using that, you know, you were heating everything up with that. I think that's a pretty clever idea. Yeah, totally. Like, I mean, the innovation and the experimentation is probably going to happen in these environments like parking lots that aren't the domain of government roads, right? Yeah, yeah. And I I think this is genius to to do. This guy actually did um, get a grant. He got like a $100,000 grant from the government to build a prototype. But now he's going to crowdfunding. He's like, I'm done with the government. I'm going to try to go ask for um, crowdfunding to raise a million dollars to actually do this in a parking lot. So good luck to him. That's that's pretty Absolutely. cool. I'm, I'm, I support him. And it's cool. Like maybe we'll, you know, maybe we'll have that in the future where um, we'll see the roads lighting up and it'll be like those solar lights that you can put in your yard. Yeah. Or just the efficiency of collecting the energy and dispersing that around, you mm. know, to, to places that need it. I think that's great. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> I think, you know, this is Sex and Science Hour. We're almost done. We're almost out of time for the show. But uh, I think we got to talk about sex, Brian, because um, we haven't done enough sex. of that this this time. You can never talk enough about sex. Yeah, it's, that's true. I mean, I want it to be a show that's like, you know, I want it to be an informative show, but also entertaining. Infotainment. You know? and, and sex is important. It's not like sex is a frivolous topic. It's a part of everyone's life. And sometimes it relates to Bitcoin, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although sometimes it's a stretch, but that's okay. Even if it doesn't, you know, it's an important part of life. And it's why we're all here, right? Absolutely. None of us would be here if it wasn't for if sex. If it wasn't for sex, that's right. None of us. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you brought in this article about what your body type says about your sex life, which these are like these studies, sometimes dubious studies, but studies about like what people find attractive and like what personality traits that correlates with or like certain body features like the length of your ring finger and then testosterone correlation i think that one is dubious personally but and i've looked into it um but there are well you know it's at least true for somebody (laughs) no comment uh (laughs) (laughs) uh, there there are some interesting studies that kind of link uh certain preferences like for instance did you know that um men who prefer large breasts are actually more sexist they hold more sexist beliefs yeah see that's specious I I don't know about that. Somebody actually tested it, and they asked men about their preference for 
breast size on women. And the men that said that they liked the larger sized breasts, actually, their attitudes correlated more with um, sexist beliefs against women. Yeah, maybe it's like on average. Right. Like anything else. (laughs) Of course. Yeah. Like it's a big data set. Um, (laughs) They also said that uh, men who like small breasts um, prefer submissive partners, are financially secure and aren't interested in fatherhood and are less sexist than those who prefer large breasted women. Wait, they're less sexist, but they prefer prefer submission. Oh, Lord, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to offend the BDSM people. So I'm just going to say no comment on that. But yeah, maybe <laughs> that doesn't go together. I don't know. Um, <laughs> long legs. If you have long legs, no matter what gender you are, people are going to like that. But they only like legs that are like 5% longer than average, not 15% longer. If they're 15% longer, they were no longer seen as... Uh. Good. There's a, there's a sweet spot, a Goldilocks zone. Yeah. yeah okay. But I mean, like, if everyone, okay, if you're a woman and every other woman is walking around in heels, it makes their legs look like they're longer. So do you have to just wear, like, bigger and bigger heels to, like, pretty soon everyone's walking around on stilts. Brian. Yeah, right. Well, I, yeah, I can't stand <laughs> heels in the first place. On, on You know, I, I don't care for them on women so much. You know, I love the way they look, but they are so uncomfortable. Oh, my God. Give me five fingers or barefoot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I mean, just think about the utility of it. I mean, if you want to, like, you know, suddenly you just get overcome with lust, you know, and you want to go run off into the woods, mm. you know, for some stooping, you <laughs> you know, if, if the woman's in heels, that ain't happening. Yeah, th- there's something to it. I mean, uh, like, a lot of people say there's some psychological thing about not being able to run, and that's, like, attractive or something like that yeah men used to wear heels 200 they, years ago they were the ones that wore them they sure did the kings it was like a princely thing to do yeah hairy chests uh if a woman had a hairy father she digs hairy chests that's kind of weird uh <laughs> gay men who are tops prefer hairless twinks and <laughs> what do you prefer um uh, i'm a big fan of michael bolton with the silver gray silken chest hair no i'm totally kidding <laughs> I just I was say that's awesome. Isn't he known for his chest hair? I he's known for his hair. I, it really depends on the person it's attached to. How about yeah, that? Okay. But you know what? We are short on time, but there is like one more I wanted to get to. Big hips. A, a study um, showed that the number of partners a woman has is largely driven by how many one night stands she has. Women whose hip width is larger than fourteen point two inches have more sexual partners and casual hookups than women with hips under twelve point two inches wide. Beyonce. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know, they're saying hips, but what they really mean is booty. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, we are... Wait, wait, wait. What about, what's, the, what's the thing about the ring finger? Oh, okay. Speaking of put a ring on. <laughs> no, that was terrible. Uh, <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually um, the index finger. So um, men whose index finger is shorter than their ring finger. Uh-huh. Index fi- So the index finger is uh-huh. the first one. The shorter than the ring finger uh-huh. are more likely to have a large uh-huh. penis. Uh-huh. <laughs> and you're sitting there comparing your legs right now <clears throat> but you know what i just looked at my hand and my index finger is shorter than my ring finger does that mean i have a big dick probably does <laughs> <laughs> maybe in my bedroom drawer Swing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not attached to me uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and then there was another study, finally, this is weird, that said men with large penises actually are more likely to be cheated on by their wives and that every inch longer it was increased the likelihood of the woman being involved in extramarital partnerships by almost one and a half times. Absolute nonsense. A study found. Nonsense. I, <laughs> oh, Brian, there's a study. It must be true. And Yeah, right. I, I mean, like, a lot of these studies really are very dubious. Like, sure, we, we gotta we gotta make sure we say that because it is easy to criticize a lot of these studies. You know, it, they have every methodological, you know, small sample size and <laughs> biased researchers, and, yeah, reading into the conclusions and correlation is not causation. But it's kind of a you know interesting internet candy to talk about. Yeah. What do you think? Do you have a big ring finger? Don't answer that. Actually, long ring. Finger. We're out of time. So we'll have to say we'll see you next week. And thank you so much for tuning in to Sex and Science Hour. You've just heard Sex and Science Hour. Game over. Play again next week. 